for that uh, wonderful talk. It was an excellent introduction to what I'll talk about uh, today, <laughs> just by chance. Um, so I'm Tessa Pierce-Ward, and I'm going to talk today a little bit uh, about the work my collaborators and I have been doing on estimating average nucleotide identity from fragment hash. So first, a little background on ANI. Um, we were talking about an average um, similarity estimation across a pair of genomes. It was initially introduced back in 2005 as a, um, a genome-based proxy for the lab-based um, DNA-DNA hybridization, um, which was a method of determining whether two um, organisms were uh, members of the same species or different. Um, and the way it's uh, commonly done is using BLAST or faster blast tile algorithms to find um, homologous regions and look at the similarity between those two. So it is currently really widely used, um, especially now that we have so much genome information um, for estimating pairwise similarity. But in my opinion, um, it has uh, one major limitation, and that's just that it any alignment-based method is going to be pretty slow and not really scalable for the 10,000, 100,000 comparison scale. And even faster versions like fast ANI, which uses um, mash map to find homologous regions, um, are still challenged by the 10,000, 10, 100,000 comparison range. So to get around that, we turn to alignment-free sequence comparisons using KMERS. So you've probably heard a lot about KMERS already. Um, so KMERS sketching methods comp uh, compress data sets into um, subsets of representative KMERS um, that represent the data set. And I'm going to talk specifically just about two um, sketching methods here, uh, MinHash uh, that you heard about earlier. And MinHash um, characteristic is that it um, uses a bottom sketch approach to select a fixed number of KMERS. So for example, 1,000 KMERS or 10,000 KMERS per data set. And then FRAC MinHash uses a similar approach in selecting KMERS, but instead selects a fraction of data set KMERS. So for example, we would keep 0.1% uh, of data set KMERS. Um, and this has some neat properties that allow us to do some different things. Um, we've published this in Sarmash, um, and but it's also um, introduced as universe minimizers um, recently. Okay, so long DNA KMERS um, can be used for alignment-free distance, distance estimation between samples. So if you have two sketches um, here of genome A and genome B, the Jacquard index is the intersection over the union of those KMERS. And um, as was published in 2015, 2016, you can, um, you can transform that uh, Jacquard index into uh, something that is linearly uh, related to ANI, um, particularly within the high similarity range for MinHash. And so um, if we take a look about, at this, I really like these figures from the FAST ANI paper back in 2018. So really what we're looking at is the orange plots here, um, which, is our, which are MASH sketches, um, actually quite large MASH sketches. But in this first data set, it does really well across the range of ANI. Um, and here on the x-axis, you have ANI-B, so that's BLAST-based ANI, which is still considered the gold standard. And then on the y, you have predicted ANI for MASH and FAST ANI. But then if you look at another, a series of other data sets that they look at in the paper, there are some challenges for MASH ANI, particularly at low sequence identity, so under 90%, or very high sequence identity, um, or often with fragmented incomplete and contaminated genome assemblies. So because of the differences between FRAC MinHash and MinHash, we wanted to see if we could do a little bit better job at getting ANI. So FRAC MinHash sketches have the characteristic that they allow estimation of the containment index. So instead of um, using the union of all KMERS between the two sketches, the containment uh, uses as the denominator of just one of the sketches. And you can get both directions of the containment, but in some cases you may only be interested in a single one. For example, if you have a highly trusted reference genome uh, that you know that you have a lot of the KMERS um, are accurate, then you might be interested in the containment only, only relative to that, uh, that reference genome. So these containment comparisons are less affected by differences in sample size, which allow us to do things like comparing very large uh, metagenome uh, samples to their, uh, the relevant reference genomes, and a little bit less um, impacted by genome incompleteness and contamination, particularly when you're doing co uh, containment comparisons relative to a known reference genome. So in order to get um, uh, fragment hash ANI, a uh, few differences for MinHash. Uh, again, the first two, fragment hash and containment. 
Um, I forgot to mention that, um, so that transformation of Jacquard um, into ANI is using um, a simple mutational model where, um, where we're assuming random mutation across the genome and that all Kmers are independent. Um, and as you saw, that works decently well in some cases. But, um, but in this model, as it was published uh, I, earlier this year, um, you have the case where some uh, some Kmers are not going to be independent of each other. Um, so an example here, if you have this stretch of base pairs here, and you have a single nu nucleotide mutation in red, then if you bake Kmers, here I'm using K length of four, um, you're going to see that K Kmers, or four Kmers in this case, are affected by that single nucleotide polymorphism. So those mutated Kmers are not independent of each other. And you can actually consider this when trying to get ANI out of um, your, what, your composite Kmers. So a lot of that work was done by my collaborators, um, Mahmoud Ramanhara and David Kozlicki. Um, so I'll leave that preprint up there um, and uh, feel free to ask us about it, but I'll go into kind of what it looks like. So if we take a um, single staphylococcus genome and in silico introduce mutations so that we're aware of exactly what um, the exact distance between these genomes. Um, here, I'm using ortho ANIU as the um, gold standard uh, alignment method, but it's very similar to ANIB. Um, and then on the y-axis, um, it's the predicted distance. So here, I've put the ANI as well. It's a little bit backwards. But you can see, um, hopefully you can see the one-to-one -one line there um, where the uh, fragment hash sketches um, using a scale of 1,000, which is also 0.1% of all cameras, um, do pretty well even out to ANI ranges that we don't typically look at. Right, um, almost out to 50% ANI. And the MASH sketches do quite well in the lower ranges, um, but are less reliable as you get out to wider evolutionary distances. So this is the ideal scenario, right? We've taken a, a genome in, in silico introduced mutations. So what if we do um, something that's a little bit more realistic? Um, these are 21 pairs of randomly selected uh, pairs of genomes from uh, NCBI. And you see the same plot um, where uh, both minhash uh, and fragment hash do quite well in the you know 90% to 100% ANI region, um, and then as you get out to wider evolutionary distances, fragment hash is still able to um, be very comparable to alignment-based ANIs, whereas the um, minhash uh, comparisons do not do as well. Okay, so this is 21 comparisons. What if we uh, scale up a little bit further? This is um, 9,000 comparisons. And primarily I'm focusing here on the lower range. So we'll see if we can get at the 90% and under ANI range. And I ran comparisons here um, for our fragment hash at a case size of 21, as well as fast ANI and um, mummer-based ANI, as well as uh, blast-based ANI, which is on the x-axis. And you can see the one-to-one -one line is in uh, black, and I want to point out that none of these methods are exactly on the one-to-one -one line with anion blast, um, but they're all in the same sort of range. Um, and and you can see that the uh, you know fast anion is typically only trusted to that 80% range, and that's because it becomes less reliable under there. So why am I bringing up all these alignment-based methods? There was a paper published in 2020 that showed a series of alignment-based methods. Um, this is the same plot over here with five alignment methods. Um, and it's showing that, you know, all of them are a little bit different than A and I B, but as long as you're doing comparisons between A and I values of the same method, you can use them to distinguish genomes that are in, you know, in these ranges. So if you buy into this, that, you know, it's still useful as long as we are comparing only between A and I values, um, produced by the same method, then let's think a little bit more about, um, the upper end of the range. So I showed you a K size of 21, and typically if you're using cameras, we use K21 to get at species and genus level comparisons, right? We have um, the ability to detect out to that level. And when we want to look at strain level comparisons, we typically want to increase the length of our K size so that we can get at um, those very smaller, uh, those smaller differences between strains. So here I've just put up in the 95% range, um, all the, this is 22,000 comparisons of um, genomes found within GTDB, where um, these are the patterns for K21 ANI that we have, uh, get from fragment hash to K51. And I want to point out that while K21 is closer to that one-to-one -one line overlap with BLAST-based ANI, it's a much uh, wider cloud. Whereas if you look at K51, it's very tight. So the, the, it still has a linear relationship 
but it's just a different pattern than A and IB. So I think that this can be really useful, and so I wanted to talk about a couple applications for fragment hash. First, of course, since it's a sketching method, we can do really, really large database um, scale comparisons. Um, and then we can do um, a &I from fragmented or contaminated genomes, particularly when we're doing um, comparisons to reference genomes with known uh, trusted gamers. And the last thing um, is something that we're currently unable to do with most other methods that I think this offers an opportunity, and that's um, taking directly uh, ANI, getting ANI directly from read data sets. So if you have a metagenome, um, similar to Kraken, SourMesh has a method where you can um, very accurately figure out the series of best genomes that match. So we take, um, this is a figure from our recent preprint, we take um, the metagenome, we find all matching genomes. In this, in the top case, that's like 400,000 because there are like 200,000 salmonella genomes in, in the database. Um, and then we can pull down to that 19 that are really the closest genomes. And we can get an ANI um, from your read, the relevant portion of your reads to that reference genome. And I think that's a really powerful um, new functionality that um, I haven't seen existing for sketching based data sets. Uh, and my question slide is not showing up. Okay, well, uh, questions. I wanted to say that we have now implemented um, SourMesh Frackman hash ANI. Um, there it is, uh, into SourMesh 4.4.1. Um, and you can find us online. And thanks to all my collaborators, and thanks for listening. So, any question for Tira? Oh, thank you so much for the talk. I was wondering if you could uh, give a little bit of intuition as to why all of these techniques seem to systematically overestimate, or not um, many of them seem to systematically overestimate A and I. And so it seems like everything's just like shifted as a line. And like, why can't you just correct for that? So I'd like to offer that, flip that on his head. Um, could you have you considered the idea that maybe BLAST-based ANI is underestimating similarity? Because when we're doing BLAST um, ANI, you can really only consider those large regions that um, can be aligned to each other. And here with cameras, we're finding any piece of similarity in a 21, 51 um, base pair region. So I think actually you're getting a more fine-grained picture of what's going on. Um, it's just that we have adopted BLAST-based ANI as a standard, <laughs> uh, despite the fact that it was actually initially just introduced as like a good proxy for DNA-DNA hybridization. So um, I actually might argue that these are a little bit closer to what's really happening. Thank you. Hey, great talk. A quick Thanks. question about, uh, I think, second last slide, we showed that how reads can be used to identify the genomes that are present. I wonder, I mean, this could be a really good application for verifying binning algorithms, but have you tested it against like actual binning? Like, are there like how many mags are that you recover and are they like corresponding to what you're seeing from the reads? I haven't tested it against binning, but we've extensively tested SourMesh Gather, which is the, the method that we use to um, identify. And that is extremely accurate and doesn't provide any um, false positives for what genomes are present. Um, so in this case, I'm just taking the containment value from the SourMesh gather output and, and converting it into an ANI. Okay. Did that sort of answer? So we haven't, we haven't done much binning, but that is, yeah, that's maybe a, a good yeah. idea to check. I mean, because one of the things that I've always been told is that reads can be like, like identifying taxonomy from reads is like not that accurate. Like, well, assembly and binning is like the go-to thing. So I was like, wow. So I'll just put a clarification on that. So um, instead of using individual camers, what SourMesh Gather does is it finds the best group of camers. Um, so what you're finding is uh, you're using a minimum set cover approach to find the best reference genome that matches like a chunk of camers and then doing that iteratively to get the like 19 genomes. So then we do taxonomy at the genome level rather than at the individual camer level. And when you're adding that, like since you're very confident that you have this genome because you found a lot of portions from it in your reference, um, when you add taxonomy on top of that, it turns out to be much more accurate. Just a quick follow up by 19. What? Like, like, why just stop at 19 genomes? Uh, oh, that that is the result from like, oh, there okay. were 400,000 matches, and but actually those corresponded to 19 uh, genomes. Oh, okay. So th what's just, happening yeah. there, right, is you have some yeah. different, this is a mock data set, so, yeah. uh, but like in your, whatever your metagenome is, you might have a different strain that's not in the database, but you'll match like 
400,000, right? Yeah. 200,000 of those were different salmonella strains, but yeah. you probably have one strain in there. Yeah, yeah. So can you find the closest strain in the reference to and, and ignore all sorry, ignore all other like sure. 400,000? Thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks. Okay, I, I think uh, one last yeah. uh, uh, question from online. So from uh, Curtis Hodhauer. Uh, so I'm curious if you evaluated specific arrays for the metagenome application, we've seen direct read to reference DB comparison like this to have good sensitivity, but often prone to false positives. Yeah. Yeah, so actually if you saw, if anyone saw the charcoal talk earlier, Taylor put the very nice figure up um, with uh, Sour Mash and we did some comparisons with um, Cami data sets and, um, and other, uh, other methods and Sarash has uh, the best false positive rate, which is to say we don't have false positives. Um, so I think it's the different approach, right? We're not just using similar uh, single camers, we're taking this to genomes and then getting taxonomy from those matched genomes as opposed to doing it um, from an LCA approach from uh, each individual camer.